it's about preparation. The preparation is absolutely critical. Um, as we know, we've got a delay coming up, uh, still to be completely confirmed, but we know it's definitely going to happen. Um, and the reason for preparation is there's a cost to the discipline regime. So market participants, you know, you're going to be liable to, to be hit with penalties, uh, foul trade charges against every transaction that fails to settle under the mandated T plus two settlement timeframe. And then worst case scenario, also be hit with quite an expensive buy-in should that failing trade uh, then not settle um, based on a, a set extension period based on the asset class or liquidity status of, of that transaction. So again, um, so we saw large increases in trade failure, obviously. I mean, if we look at ESMA's recent um, trends, uh, validation and risk report that was published recently, I think at the height of the COVID pandemic, we saw equity trades in particular, 10% increase in March, 12% in April. Um, and again, if, and if you're a nerd like me and you follow things like the Target 2 security settlement data as well, we've actually seen um, an increase in trade failure from 2018 to 2019. And I think you could probably put your mortgage on the fact that that is going to increase again in 2020. So I think while the preparations were progressing really well prior to the delay being announced, any delay to regulation, the industry is really relieved you know, to be given additional time to prepare and maybe reorganise themselves. If we look at general readiness, um, you could probably expect, and this is the case that we're seeing in conversations with clients, you know, the big investment banks, the top 15, um, the larger interdealer brokers, the large buy side institutions seem to be very prepared. Um, some of the smaller regional brokers, they know what's coming, they know what's required of them, uh, but maybe with lesser resources, um, it, it's slightly more difficult for them to implement the changes necessary. Uh, they're still prepared though, what I would say, but maybe not as advanced as other market participants. If we look at Europe in general, the participants are probably where they need to be. Um, it's a rare conversation now when someone says to you, what is the discipline regime? You know, They know what's going to potentially hit them in regards to the discipline regime. But what became apparent in a recent series of CSDR educational roadshows that we conducted in Q1, Q2 this year was interestingly the Nordic region seemed really behind the curve um, compared to places like Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Netherlands and obviously the UK. Um, I mean, something you could look at is there's probably fewer trade associations in those regions because some of those regions fall outside of the EU zone or the Eurozone. Um, so that could be a reason why, um, why they weren't as up to speed as other parts of Europe. The trade association have done a fantastic job in regards to education, awareness, and also flagging complexities that the discipline regime may bring to European markets. There's huge extraterritorial impact of the discipline regime. In the US, I would say from definitely from January this year, we've seen a huge, like a massive increase in awareness around the discipline regime. Um, preparations are moving forward, levels of awareness. Again, um, institutions are talking to each other. They're talking to the trade associations, infrastructures, which is always good. Um, for Asia, they, they was probably slightly later to the table than the US. I would say probably more around Q1 we started to see real engagement from firms in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, but I guess Asia's probably better uh, equipped to cope with a discipline regime. You know, places like uh, Taiwan, Korea, they've already got very strict and punitive discipline regimes in place today. Although they're structured slightly differently uh, to what the SDR mm -hmm. will bring, you know, being hit of a penalty for failing the trade isn't something new to them. So what we are doing as a firm institutional trade processing, we're speaking to all of our clients globally to make, you know, encourage them to um, engage with their European entities where they're global firms, engage with their European counterparts to make sure that everybody's aware and up to speed in what's going to be required to meet the SDR obligations come February 2022. It shouldn't really have too much of an impact. I mean, some firms see it as it's one less market to worry about, so that's good. Other firms see it as it's adding slightly more fragmentation into the European region, so that could be a problem. However, what we're telling our UK domicile clients, as well as all of our clients globally, is if you're transacting in European securities that will ultimately settle at European domicile CSD, you're in scope for SDR, so you need to get ready to comply with the regulation. And the really quick answer is absolutely yes. I mean, and the interesting thing we've seen is although um, the extension or the delay, you know, everyone's known about this for some time now, 
firms haven't taken their foot off the gas. I mean, what you sometimes see is a regulation gets delayed by a year, then those project teams are repurposed somewhere else in the organisation. We don't really see that happening with the discipline regime of CSDR. So I think that speaks volumes about the complexities and the impact that it can potentially have in regards to, um, you know, trade processing or post-trade processing across European markets. And I think what we're going to start to see happening now is firms may take a little bit more time in regards to decision making. And what I mean by that is it's probably a very well-known fact that some firms will need to engage with third-party providers, uh, platform vendors, in order to make sure they're fully prepared uh, to meet the, the discipline regime obligations and also make themselves you know, failure-proof, as it were. So what I would expect to see happening now is firms taking the remainder of 2020 to start to you know, analyse what's out there, maybe hold fire on some decisions they were going to make. Um, we would expect maybe by the end of Q1 2021 for those decisions to have been made and firms to be comfortable around if they do need to adopt platforms and providers, who they'll be. Um, you then have to look at onboarding implementation. That can easily take a number of months. So Q3, or sorry, Q2, Q3 2021, you can expect a big onboarding exercise and lots of um, implementation you know, and integration readiness in order for those platforms to start integrating with one another. What I would say, though, um, per speaking personally and, you know, working at DTCC, it's the readiness factor and it's testing, 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 testing. So you need to be kind of ready, decisions made, systems integrated easily by October 2021. So allow yourself a good solid three months of testing in regards to what these platforms are going to provide for you. Obviously, you've got to take into account code freezes in December, um, you know, and the holiday seasons across late December and early January. Then I think one of the key points as well is every firm's different. There isn't going to be a one size fits all for the buyer side. There's not going to be a one size fits all for everybody. So each firm needs to take the time to analyze their setups, their processes, and more importantly, address any vulnerabilities or gaps, especially manual processing that they currently have in their trade architecture. So what we're telling firms as a great starting point is simply analyze your trade failure rates as they are today, um, understand why your trades are failing and where they're failing. And obviously this can lead to some, you know, some tricky conversations because you could be a large buy side firm, you're getting excellent prices from a particular broker, low commissions, but they're failing every single transaction, which is probably going to cause you a problem. Again, so there's some reputational damage that could be had here. Um, but when I talk about manual touch points, if, if you look at what the ideal no-touch workflow would look like. It would be trade execution and then no human being touches that transaction until you've got settlement finality. And that's, that's readily available today and it can happen, but it doesn't always. So where firms do have these manual touch points, um, they need to look to create efficiencies around that and automate that as much as possible because the more time something's manually touched, um, the more chance you've got of that particular trade failing. Um, and that goes for pre-settlement as well as post-settlement. You know, uh, we've seen some real uptake in our exception manager service. So ex an exception management solution we've brought to the market that enables all of our clients to manage their process in these and exception in one easy place. So now we've got, you know, upwards of 13 custodians, brokers, PBs, prime brokers, and so on, all actively submitting data into the platform in a nice unified format uh, so our clients can get the benefit of real-time exception management. We probably highlighted this to our clients around about 18 months ago, that the impact of front office is going to be phenomenal for, um, for the settlement discipline regime. Operations as a whole, back office, middle office, post trade, whatever you call it, it's a cost center. You know, it doesn't generate revenue, it doesn't create wealth, uh, but it can lose money. So again, so that relationship between the middle, back office and front office is going to be really important in, I would say, in two key areas. The first one being buy-ins. Um, so there's still some decision making that needs to be done from buy side and sell side as to who's going to own the buying process. Is it going to be the front office guys? Is it going to be the middle office guys? Uh, the middle office argue that, you know, it's a new transaction. There's price discovery. So that's a front office requirement. The front office guys say, well, it's just a way to fulfill settlements. So it's middle office. So that decision needs to be made. Um, second to that is also the, the volume of buy-ins or the perceived volume of buy-ins that could come to the market once the discipline regime goes live. If the volumes are as high as what you expect them to be, you can easily imagine banks or IMs carving out a new role, whether that's in the front office or middle office, to purely handle the buying process itself. Then we look at settlement itself. So we all know there's Chinese walls between the front office and operations um, you know, for audit purposes and road trading activity and so on. So the front office don't get a view of what's actually settled. 
And what the SDR is going to bring to the market is partial settlement. So a transaction could be struck for, say, 10,000 shares, and you may only settle 5,000 of that, and then 5,000 remains unsettled. So under the SDR rules, any outstanding balance that's unsettled will be applicable to receive penalties against that. But more importantly, if there's still an outstanding balance of shares or bonds that's unsettled after the buy-in extension periods, you only buy in that um, that balance of unsettled transactions, like shares or bonds. So the front office don't know that. So in a worst case scenario, if a, a trade's been partialed, the front office don't know. They then go and buy in the whole amount. That can cause huge settlement and funding problems. So the, the transparency, the reconciliation, the engagement, you know, communication between front, middle and back is going to be key to make sure the correct amount is being bought at the right time. Mm-hmm.